All right. Okay, go ahead. Thank you, Roger. So my name is Dennis Watson. I'm the Vice President of Business Development for Trevera. And we are personalizing cancer treatments in a very unique way. Um, I, I won't waste our time with, with some of this slide here. Everybody knows the problem. It's already been touched on several times before, but the reality is, is there are a lot of, op there's a lot of opportunity that exists in the cancer treatment market. Few patients um, are really getting the treatments that they need and finding the right therapy for the right patient at the right time is an incredibly challenging task. The main thing that's driving this today is, is industry uh, societal guidelines, NCCN, ASCO, et cetera, things that are based on clinical trial data, based on expert opinion, et cetera, offer really a, a paradigm for treatment for patients that statistically tends to work pretty well in earlier stage disease. But once patients get into later stage disease into advanced treatment paradigms, um, getting the second or third line of therapy, the likelihood of matching a patient to an effective treatment becomes well below 20% in most tumor types. And most patients will face a page like the one you see sort of small on the screen there, where when you're looking at a recurrence, um, you'll, you'll face a list of 20 or 30 different drugs, often listed alphabetically. There's just a real lack of clear guidance at this in this environment. And so what Trevair is really offering is an improved solution to uh, to find the right therapy for the right patient in a rapid turnaround. Uh, this is a new generation of drug testing. We measure patients' live cancer cells ex vivo to a large panel of, of cancer drugs, uh, customized to each patient, up to 20 drugs at a time. We can do this in immunotherapy as well. And there are a handful of things that make our approach very unique in the ex vivo drug market. So really what makes what we do possible is the development of a new measurement tool that came out of a biophysics lab at MIT. And so this is a MIMS device. It's a very small fluidics device that you can see on the fingertip here and in this artist rendition. And essentially we pump single cells through this device one at a time and they pass over this cantilever. As they do, just like when you jump off of a diving board into a swimming pool, that cantilever changes its frequency, changes its vibration. And we're able to measure that frequency to get accurate mass measurements down to about 50 femtograms. That is such a small measurement of an individual cell mass that we could actually recognize change in mass of a single cell that would be equivalent to that cell losing about five nanometers of diameter. The reason that particular comparison is, is important is because the next best measurement tool that exists in the world today to measure cell mass is a light microscope. But the uh, wavelength of visible light is anywhere between 400 and 700 nanometers, meaning that a light microscope can never recognize changes smaller than 400 nanometers. So we're almost 100 times more precise than that. So with the ability to measure very small changes in cellular mass to a degree that much more precise than anyone has seen before, the team at MIT took this to Dana-Farber and we said, we know that when a cell dies, it loses about half of its mass in, in cell death. We know that for a cancer cell, in response to an effective cancer therapy, that on average takes about a week, uh, four to five days. So the question became, when a cancer cell is responding to an effective therapy, might it change its mass by a small amount, even just three or four percent, in the first few hours of the first day? small enough amounts that they were pre previously immeasurable. And the answer to this question turned out to be kind of a resounding yes. We have almost a universal biomarker here in that if a cancer drug is affecting a cancer cell, it inevitably changes that cell. And those, change, those changes lead to mass changes that we can recognize. So the way that the test clinically works is, is quite simple. We provide a test kit. Um, this is a CLIA-approved LDT. We are running this commercially in the U.S. and uh, along with, with many clinical validation trials that are ongoing. But essentially, we get a, a specimen of live cancer cells from a fresh biopsy, fine needle aspiration, uh, surgical resection, 
or malignant fluid collection from ascites or pleural effusion, drop it into our kit, ship it to our, our to our lab overnight via FedEx and our in our special shipping kits. Once we get that, we isolate out the cancer cells. We aliquot them out to about five thousand cells per well in a in a in a ninety six well plate. We apply drug to some, keep others as controls. We incubate for twenty four hours. The image on your screen here is actually one drug example. As I said, we do about 20 drugs at a, at a time in a full panel. But essentially what would happen here is you've got 5,000 cells in this blue cup with a drug and 5,000 cells in the, gray trup, in the gray cup without a drug, 24 hours of incubation. And then we pass every single cell through our, our suspended microchannel resonator chip. And we're able to build these mass distributions so we're able to see 5,000 individual measurements per sample and compare the drug specimen of 5,000 individual measurements to the control. If those two curves overlap and basically mirror each other, it's essentially telling us that this drug was placebo. It's had no impact on these cells. But if we see a, a statistical shift in the distribution of cell mass in those two specimens in that first 24 hour period, that's what tells us that the drug is beginning to work. As I said, uh, this is not a, a new concept, the idea of ex vivo drug testing, but the way we're doing it is a paradigm shift. There are a lot of companies that have tried this over the years. We've tried ex vivo drug testing, chemosensitivity testing in the cancer market since the 1950s, and there has not been clear, consistent success identified. And the main reason is because the drugs, the cells die faster than the drugs can kill them. And so historically, Every technology that has come before has had to take that live cancer cell specimen and grow cells. We're the first to do this directly on the patient cells because we can get our measurements so fast, we don't have to grow them into a PDX or an organoid or in a culture or any other methodology that requires pumping those, those cells full of cytokines and growth factors and proteins and, and different things that inevitably can change the phenotype, the genotype of the cells, sometimes just growing up the wrong subclonal populations and creating sort of challenges in what we're testing versus what was removed from the patient. We've done this in, in uh, over 300 patients um, in the last year or so, and we have full outcomes on the first 60 of those in which patients received the test. They then were administered one of the 20 drugs we, we analyzed, and then we found out whether or not there was a clinical response. These are primarily late stage patients, most of which are on second, third, or later lines of therapy, where the likelihood of finding an effective drug is very low. And our statistical uh, predictive accuracy right now is sitting at about 85%, very strong in both positive predictions and negative predictions. So we're, uh, we're doing this right now across 39 different tumor types. Um, we've validated 100, over 100 different FDA cleared drugs, and uh, there's a great opportunity to continue doing this. It is commercially available. We're continuing to, to grow this out, as I said, in a lot of different ways. We've got numerous academic research partners all over the country. And uh, if anybody would like more information or, or would like to discuss any further, my information's on the screen. All right. Thank you very much, Dennis.